So I want to talk more about metabolic metabolic flexibility. I want to say it three times fast. Um, because this is, I think, a really big uh, topic for the women in the Healing Rosie community, especially. You know, there's a lot of us that are dealing with some variation of flabby, foggy, and fatigued. In my case, I found out a year ago that I had mold toxicity. Um, I also have uh, found some heavy metals, aluminum and mercury, um, that I need to take care of. I've been working on taking care of. Um, I my my mold issues probably go back at least a decade, um, maybe even further than that. But to an event where the mercury fillings were improperly drilled from my mouth, I gained 45 pounds in about three or four months. It was very scary. Um, I was living in a house built in 1892, a beautiful restored Victorian in Nashville, Tennessee and likely picked up a lot of mold in that environment. Mm -hmm. And over time, I watched, I have my labs all the way back from when my journey first started. Over time, my thyroid is crashing, going down, down, down. My adrenals going down, 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 right? Everything is going down because I have this load of toxicity that my body cannot eradicate on its own. And I don't know it's there, right? So I don't, I don't know to eradicate it. So if I go into our Facebook group today and just start scrolling through, you're going to see women giving many variations of the same story, but basically there's toxicity issues and all these other things. So metabolic flexibility, I think is a really important piece of, of being able to leverage the benefits of intermittent fasting. And I would love for you just to talk to us about how we restore metabolic flexibility when we've gone through something that has compromised our systems in some way. I would say many of the listeners would fit that picture, right? How do we, how do we know that we're metabolically inflexible and then how do we restore metabolic flexibility? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it is a really important topic. And I'm sorry to hear about that with the mold, because that can be a serious issue. If we are constantly in an environment that is creating a fight or flight response, right? All the time, right? Like you're sleeping and you're breathing in mold and it's just creating this fight or flight response, overloading your system with toxicity and Mold in particular, those mycotoxins really have an affinity for your neuroendocrine system. Like I was talking about your pituitary gland, your, your um, hypothalamus, right? And they affect your leptin levels, which now you don't get satiety. They drive up inflammation throughout your body. So um, it can be a really, really big deal. And, um, you know, if there is a chronic, a serious chronic stressor, it's very hard to build metabolic flexibility until you reduce that stressor. And that could be like a really bad relationship, somebody yelling at you all the time, or it could be, um, you know, PTSD, right? Uh, Post-traumatic stress disorder. It could be mold toxicity. Um, you know, it could be heavy metals that you're being exposed to. It could be, you know, a bad reaction to a pharmaceutical event, right? Things like that. Um, could be, you know, a virus, bad reaction to COVID-19 or something like that, right? So all these things, we've got to do the best we can to to reduce our exposure to, right? First off, and that that is really key. Um, and, and, and then from there, as we're building metabolic flexibility, and this is really something that um, it should be a part of all healing protocols, um, is building this level of metabolic flexibility. The way you know you're metabolically flexible is you're able to go longer periods of time without food and be able to function properly, right? Like if you can go 16 hours without eating and you feel good, right? You're able to do all the things that you need to do, you know, and then you eat a meal and you don't just crash afterwards, right? That's a sign that you're pretty metabolically flexible. It's actually really good, okay? Um, if you can't do that, if you can't go more than a few hours without consuming food, or if you do fast and then you have to crash afterwards, right. You're exhausted right after you eat your first, your, your meal, that's a sign of poor metabolically metabolic flexibility. And so the way that we start to build metabolic flexibility is number one is with your diet, we want to reduce the amount of sugar and carbs that are in your diet, right? So that's kind of the first step is reducing sugar, starches, different things like that, getting rid of bad fats, like uh, all your, your, your vegetable and seed oils. So that's corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, cotton seed oil, peanut oil. Um, what else? Uh, canola oil, right? All those kind of oils that you'll find in processed foods and in a lot of different condiments, just drive up inflammation in the body. So you got to get rid of those. Focus on healthy fats, avocados, extra virgin olive oil, particularly like a fresh pressed high polyphenol, extra virgin olive oil, amazing for your body. Grass-fed butter, um, coconut oil, coconut milk, um, pasture-raised eggs, grass-fed meat products, right? Animal products, things like that. 
And then I would recommend prioritizing protein in your meals, right? So the things that you want when you're looking at your meals, you want to think, okay, where is my protein? Where are my healthy fats? Where is my fiber and my polyphenols, right? And polyphenols, the way that you remember that is it's just colorful fruits and vegetables, right? You should have a lot of color in your meals. And so you want to make sure you got protein on board. I recommend at least 30 grams of protein in each meal. That's going to provide more satiety and it's going to have a good blood sugar stabilizing, insulin stabilizing effect. And then you add in good fats, right? Now, most people out there, about 30 grams of fat in a meal is great, okay? Some people actually want a little bit more, and that's usually men uh, because they, you know, particularly active men, can because they can consume more calories. For some, particularly women, um, and particularly women who've had digestive issues or maybe their gallbladder removed, might need a little bit less, like 20 grams of fat, right? So somewhere in that range, 20 to... 30 to maybe up to 40. Uh, most of your listeners probably do great in that 20 to 30, 35 range grams of fat in a meal. Again, healthy fats. So you got your protein, your healthy fats, and then you can fill it in with low glycemic vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, you know, different cruciferous vegetables, leafy greens, cucumbers, um, hearts of palm, artichokes, right? Different things like that. I love to make a Mediterranean salad, for example, with artichokes and hearts of palm and uh, tomato and bell pepper and cucumbers and things like that. Extra virgin olive oil, lemon juice on it, lots of herbs. It's one of my go-tos, right? So you're getting a lot of color in there. You can do berries, right? Berries are loaded with polyphenols, lots of color uh, in those. So that's what you should be, should be thinking about with your meals. And I recommend consuming three meals a day, okay? Uh, when you're first starting, right? Now you may be able to move to two meals a day, um, but in the beginning you do three meals a day with at least 30 grams of protein, 20 to 30 grams of fat, okay? And then lots of color and keep the grains, the starches out as much as possible. And if you do that, you're gonna notice that your body, your blood sugar stays more stable. It brings down insulin, right? Which is um, the hormone that comes and takes sugar out of the bloodstream and puts it into the cells. Insulin also, as long as insulin's elevated, all right? You can't burn fat for fuel. So. The higher your, the more carbs you're taking in, the more insulin your body's going to produce. Also, those bad fats, those seed oils, they they damage the insulin receptor, and so therefore your body starts producing more and more insulin to get the sugar out of the bloodstream and into the cells. When insulin's elevated, you're not going to be able to burn fat for fuel, right? So you've got to keep insulin down. So this kind of eating is a insulin friendly friendly eating plan, right? So you do three meals a day. Um, mm -hmm and you're consuming those meals. Now, ideally in the beginning, you do around a 12 to 14 hour fasting window and about a 10 to 12 hour eating window. What that means is, let's say you eat your first meal at 7 a.m. Then you'd wanna finish your last meal somewhere between five to 7 p.m., okay? Or let's say, you know, you don't feel super hungry in the morning, you eat your first meal at 8 a.m. And then you have till, you know, let's say six to 8 p.m., uh, to finish your last meal. So you're doing like a one-to-one -one ratio of eating, right? You're eating your meals in a 12 hour window, you're fasting in a 12 hour window. Now, when you're fasting, you don't consume any calories. You can consume water. You can consume herbal tea. If you want to do black coffee, like in the morning, that's fine. But I recommend no calories during that period of time. Okay. Or a, a minimal amount. Like if there's, you know, uh, two calories in a supplement you take, not a big deal, but um, no, you know, intentional calories that you're consuming. And so you do that. And if you can push it to 14 hours and the, the, really the best way to do that is when you wake up in the morning, you hydrate, right? So you drink 16 ounces of water or herbal tea before you even think about food. And what that does is that actually extends your stomach. And we have this hunger hormone called ghrelin. And ghrelin is released at times when we're used to eating. So if you're used to eating breakfast every morning at seven, then guess what? It's a conditioned response. Your body's going to say, it's going to release ghrelin. It's going to say, okay, this is breakfast time. I'm hungry um, because it's something you've conditioned, right? The other thing is that when there's nothing in the stomach, you release ghrelin. So as you extend your stomach through drinking high water, right? Through hydrating, now it shuts down the release of ghrelin and you no longer feel as hungry, right? You, you, in fact, most people notice that they're not even hungry when they do that. 
And particularly, I like some sort of warm beverage. It's good to tie in a warm beverage. So it could be like warm lemon water or it could be a herbal tea or something like that. Um, even coffee, right? If you do okay with coffee, um, what that does, that warm beverage actually activates your vagus nerve, which is Latin for wanderer. Vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10, travels from your brain stem down into all your viscera, your heart, your lungs, your digestive system. And in the digestive system, it activates motility or peristalsis, which is these wave-like muscle contractions in your gut to help you go poop, right? To help move things through and help you poop. And in the morning between 6 a.m. and 9 a.m., your colon is most active, meaning that that is the best time to get as much waste out as possible. And so the warm beverage will help activate that and help you move your bowels, right? And you should move your bowels once, maybe twice in the morning, um, you know, in the first hour or two of waking up. And that's a sign of a healthy digestive system. It's a sign that you're detoxifying bad estrogens, uh, different chemicals, things like that. You're getting that stuff out of your system. So the hydration will really help, particularly again, that warm beverage. You may even put a little bit of salt in there, like sea salt, uh, which can also, it, it kind of, it's a synergy there because the sea salt will also help to activate the peristalsis as well. So again, you move your bowels, coffee, a lot of people use coffee to help move the bowels. So again, as long as, you know, coffee doesn't stimulate more cravings, right? Really, when you drink coffee, it's coffee is a performance enhancement tool. So when you drink coffee, you should feel great. If you notice that you're having cravings, uh, you, you crash two hours, two or three hours after having coffee, you feel more inflamed, more joint pain, brain fog, then don't drink coffee, right? You're not responding well to it uh, if that's the case. However, if you do feel great um, and it helps you move your bowels, I think that's a good thing. Uh, coffee itself is a bitter herb, which is actually really good for the liver. Um, so it helps with detoxification. Again, helps move things through your bowels. So that's a great strategy. So hydrating well in the morning, eating those meals with at least 30 grams of protein, somewhere in that 20 to maybe 35 gram rate ratio of fat, of healthy fats in the meal. Lots of uh, color in your meals, doing that three meals, no snacks, okay? No snacks, three meals a day, right? If you notice that you eat those three meals with at least, you know, following the criteria I talked about, and you're just still hungry, you might actually need a little bit more protein or a little bit more fat or maybe both. So if you're not bloating after your meals, right? You don't feel like, oh my gosh, I just ate too much. You know, that, that, that kind of feeling that we get, you may just need a little bit more, right? So you can add in just a little bit more, especially if you're active, you may notice that for most people, they notice, I would say 90% of people who are not like doing intense physical training, 30 grams of protein, 20 to 35 grams of fat in a meal, and then fiber with, with these vegetables they are like, Whoa, I'm good. <laughs> That, that satiated me, right? And so that's mo what most people will notice. And that's going to start building that metabolic flexibility.